You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with, with Sam Cedar. It is Wednesday, July 5th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, North Korea now at a crisis point, launching an intercontinental ballistic missile test successfully. Also on the program today, assuming we're still around, Republican senators get slammed on health care during their July 4th celebrations. And newsflash, Republicans still love Donald Trump. Meanwhile, Chris Christie, the former darling of the alt-center, now the loneliest man in the world. Donald Trump starts his European vacation backpacking throughout Europe with Putin as his aides fear what they'll talk about. Sorry, Europe. D.C. Circuit Court tells the EPA it must do its job. And 44 states tell Chris Kobach and his voter suppression panel to suck it. You can't have private information. Meanwhile, Canada compensates and apologizes to a former Guantanamo Bay prisoner. And the House Republicans can't release a budget until they agree on how much children should suffer. And lastly, the uh, science division in the White House Office of Science and Technology is now gone. All that and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope you had a happy 4th of July um, and a, a good weekend. Um, I assume everybody here, Matt, Kelly, Michael, all had fun times. Tremendous. Great. Well, tremendous. I, I mean, I'm Great just. Times. I'm just saying that. I, actually, I had a good time. I like taking you up on those fake offers of yours because I'm not. You... I'm not asking. I'm just said I trust that oh, you did. I trust. And it wasn't I, even a fake open. I sort of think probably most of you did not. I mean, Matt probably just got high and uh, that's played a good video time games. For Matt. And good that's time for Matt. Peak, but everybody else probably there was some problem. No, was... I got high in the sense that I was on a rooftop. Nice, oh nice. God. Did you watch the fireworks? Hi, Mrs. I Lack. didn't have a good angle of the fireworks. No good angle of the fireworks. Kelly, but I've seen, been there, done that. You've seen fireworks before. Everybody here, I think, is old enough that fireworks are not as quite as exciting. Yeah, they're n- I, I don't get the whole fireworks excitement thing. But, uh, no, my neighbors always have a uh, barbecue, and so I participate in that. And then my dog freaks out. Great. I'm sure you had a great time. I had a great time. Typical fun time having pleasant to be around ways. Yes, it was. um, It was so fun. Ow, my ears hurt. God damn it. I I have now, uh, you know, like 25 years ago when I would watch fireworks, I would just start getting angry that we were um, like, oh, this would be great. This is this is fun. We're bombing places around the world right now. And then we're pretending like we're getting bombed, but it doesn't hurt us. That's basically what the fireworks are, um, and that's, that's and thoughts. so I would get uh, I would, sometimes I would drink too hurt. much and I would get angry on the on a roof somewhere. And fortunately, the people I hung out with were, were basically would just go along with that, and they would all get angry too. And um, sometimes people do get hurt by the fireworks, like that, that's so true. maybe that would make you feel better. Yes, I mean people sometimes just get hurt at a party because they slip because someone spilled the drink, and so I mean that happens. <laughs> no, <but laughs> All right, uh, let's get uh, on to this. Uh, just one uh, bit of house cleaning. You've heard me say at the beginning of this program that we are a four-time award-winning show. We have won the podcast awards at podcastawards.com four 
times. We won it four times in a row, but only four times out of the past five years. Why? Because last year they had a rule change where if you had won four times over the past five years, you had to uh, become a legacy show and you couldn't participate. Well, they have changed that rule again to it's five times. So we're now eligible to win. So all you got to do is head over to um, podcastawards.com and you can nominate the show. And I'm trying to see like where, where you nominate it. I'm, see, nominations are open. Oh, you can just, okay, so click here right at the top. You click there and uh, you... You have to verify you gotta, yourself through email. Yes, yeah, so you got to create a, an account because they had a little, little process. They had a little bit of uh, a problem last time, I guess. People were setting up fake accounts. I thought what Pacman did was disgraceful. It was a real shame. It was a real shame. He had to ruin it for everybody. Uh, but uh, there it is, and um, you go in, you log in, and you uh, nominate the show, the Majority Report, and. Um, for and news, then, and, news and politics. News right? and politics. Yeah. And then we vote. Uh, we will vote. Uh, you will vote for us, hopefully, down the road. All right, I want to get that out of the way. I want to get to some of these uh, news stories. But uh, last week we referenced this briefly, that um, California's single-payer legislation is um, basically stalled, sidelined, by the specifically by the California Assembly Speaker, Anthony Rendon who shelved it, at least for this year. Now, people should see this in context. Um, First off, Sheldon, I mean, Rendon, I should say, is uh, clearly sort of uh, making it easier for some of the more conservative members of the California uh, Assembly uh, to avoid a vote. However, with that said, and the bill is SB 562, David Dayan did a really good piece on this um, that I think lays out the argument, not I think, but lays out the argument in what I think is a very succinct and clear way that the bill as presented was never going to go anywhere because California has... In response to Proposition 13, which we've talked about on the show, because it came to Massachusetts, Proposition 13, back in the 80s. In fact, and it basically said it limited the amount of property taxes that could be raised. And it decimated the schools in, uh, in Massachusetts. I presume it did something like that in California. But I remember, I remember the year that that happened. Well, in 1988, there was a response to California's Proposition 13, which was Proposition 98. And it required that roughly 40% of all the general fund revenues in California's general fund go to K-12 through education. So understand what that means. You have... I'm just going to use simple numbers here because I don't know the California budget numbers, and they're much bigger than this. But um, And I've got to keep everything in round numbers because I don't want to have to involve math in this too specifically. Yeah, we've got to maintain But if you have here. a $100 million budget, at least $40 million of it needs to go to education. To raise the taxes for... Single-payer health care. I'm just going gonna, gonna to pick a number in this little uh, hypothetical world I'm talking about. Let's say you need $100 million more to pay for single-payer health care in California. So now the general budget is $200 million, which means statutorily that $80 million needs to go to education. In other words, of the $100 million that you raised to pay for single payer, $40 million of that is taken away. So you'd actually need to raise $200 million, or like closer to $150 million, 
160 million to pay for the 100 million dollars for single payer. So what needs to happen in California is there needs to be a referendum because California is all referendumary that either provides a permanent waiver when it comes to revenues derived specifically for single payer or unshackles them from that dynamic. And Dane makes the uh, argument in this piece that no one, that even though um, this guy, Rendon, certainly is a bit of a corporatist and certainly protecting his uh, assembly members, but no one in the community who is arguing for this, none of the big constituencies, the California Nurses Association, which is a very strong union out there. The nurses unions across the country are great. California is um, not, not exactly the same as the national one, but they're, these are very aggressive, very strong, and, um, and good unions. It's just that um, Dan is saying that there are outside groups, <clears throat> and even the union is not being honest with supporters of single payer and and wasting in many respects the energy that's going in there for something that they know the process in which they're following cannot lead to this because there is a constitutional problem in California. So the bottom line is people need to be more honest with what they're doing instead of just trying to whatever their whatever gain they're trying to get out of this. I mean it's not hard to look at some of these outside groups and say, "Hey, I understand what the value is for them. They can keep saying, "Send us money to promote a uh, single payer." When they know it can't happen unless this referendum is addressed and they're not telling the people that they're raising money from and they don't seem to have any plans to Raise the enormous amount of money you need for a statewide referendum. So there's a little bit of disingenuousness involved in this. And you can see this down the line, right? It's a freebie. I don't think Dayan's in any way apologizing for Rendon. But it is a way for a lot of people to take sort of a, a, f a free shot without really genuinely either knowing what they're talking about or specifically not informing their constituencies for what it's actually going to take. And that's a recipe for a lot of people becoming disenchanted and disillusioned in the process. You promise them a pie in the sky, and you don't tell them, oh, but we got to spend a lot of time building a ladder. It's just as if the pie in the sky is going to descend down. No, you're going to have to climb up there. If you don't tell people what's involved in it, you're going to see that once it doesn't show up, they're going to become disillusioned and walk away from the whole process. So uh, worth checking out his piece at The Intercept. Are we going to do those spots? We're not going to do those spots today. No? Okay. Uh, all right, let's get into uh, North Korea for a moment. This is what's going on. North Korea fired an intercontinental uh, ballistic missile. It normally will send this between continents, which is why they call it an intercontinental ballistic missile. That's the type of nuanced analysis you get from this show. No other shows will tell you stuff like that. Can you slow it down a little They'll bit? just make you go throughout the day. Into what a... But, but here's the thing. This is what they did. They shot it almost straight up in the air. So they were trying to measure two things. One, distance that they could propel this thing, and its ability to re-enter... Uh, I guess it's got to go outside of like some layer of the atmosphere to re-enter and still be intact. So they shot at about 1,700 uh, miles up in the air, which apparently 
expert in this country are saying that gives it a range of 4,100 miles, which basically includes Alaska, part of Canada. It is not clear that they have the technology yet to make a nuclear weapon small enough to fit in the tip of this thing. But, Very far from. But having a functional intercontinental ballistic missile has been a line which people have, have dropped and said it's a problem once they get past this. Uh, the North Korean Central News Agency said its new intercontinental ballistic missile, the Haswang-14, was capable of hitting the heart of the United States with large, heavy nuclear warheads. Uh, like we said, that seems like a bit of an exaggeration, but Kim Jong-un <laughs> had this to say. Quote, the American bastards must be quite unhappy after closely watching our strategic decision. That's according to the news agency. Clip it for the show. I guess they're not too happy with the gift package we sent them for the occasion of their Independence Day. <laughs> we got to keep them interested. We should often send them gift packages so they won't be too bored. Oh, my God. This guy is proving more and more every day he's got more balls than his dad. I mean, but it's also... He's really outdoing his dad. It's basically... And apparently, Mr. Kim, according to the news agency, made those remarks with a guffaw. He definitely looks like he could do a guffaw. The point being is that... um, I mean, the only difference between... (laughs) Un and Trump seems to be he has a little bit better syntax. Un has better syntax and uh, he, more command he, of the English language. He's more successfully hey, Shen, taken over his inherited business. Shen, we're going to send you to North Korea and have you study up on how you do the duties of a press secretary. <laughs> Shen, why can't you say anything like that? All right, look, I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, we don't have the ability to easily knock out their nuclear program because of bunkers and whatnot. Uh, we could decimate some aspects of uh, their their firepower, but they would probably end up killing anywhere from what I've read, two hundred to five hundred thousand South Koreans. They before could immediately could... just shell Seoul with conventional weapons. Yes, and uh, but the thing that's interesting is definitely that it appears like China's really starting to lose patience with them, and that is the only kind of pressure valve that really could be applied to them and the the other and they and they any technology that north korea has for the most part is going to have come from china or and some fuel from russia as well actually but those are like the only places that deal with them exactly and china's getting fed up and the other the other you know thing though that's scary is that as crazy as the situation is, there's a certain logic to it since like the nineties, like they test, they escalate. Well, now wait we a second. Counter threat. Here, this is what I want to, I want to make clear here because the, um, a, a little bit of context is, is necessary here because I remember this from uh, the, the Bush administration in 1994, Bill Clinton, the, the, the warmonger, um, made a deal with North Korea called the Agreed Framework. Throughout the 90s, for the most part, okay, and this basically, the deal was, um, we're going to give you, we're, we're going to bribe you, essentially, to not build nuclear weapons. Um, you know, this is the dynamic. We hear libertarians saying, why didn't, uh, why didn't Lincoln just pay for all the slaves? That type of situation, right? Like, isn't that what I was saying? Like, it was yes, just, except but, it made sense in this situation. Well, in right, this situation, right, it makes right. sense because, look, they need aid. You want to impinge upon their sovereignty to build a, a weapon that they think that they need. You say, okay, look, we're going to show you another way. Here's aid. We give aid to everybody. And so the idea was we're going to provide cash in some instances, food resources, whatever it was, different other uh, diplomatic concessions. 
the U.S. did not do a great job uh, in providing what we said we were going to provide through the, um, the final years of the Clinton administration. Not a great job. It is understood, though, that North Korea basically towed the line. We were able to put uh, international monitoring in their primary nuclear facility. They basically froze um, their, uh, their uh, development and seeking of weapons-grade plutonium. All of this. In October of 2000, before the Bush-Gore uh, election turned into a selection, as you know, um, Clinton sat down with Kim Jong-il, Un's dad, and said, made a mutual pledge, we will agree that we're going to have no hostile intent towards each other, specifically, no hostile intent. And when Bush came into office, they just basically literally said, I'm not going to reaffirm that uh, handshake or that, you know, proclamation that we have no hostile intent. Um, you had just about everybody in the Bush administration who was anybody trying to torpedo specifically the agreed framework. You'll recall, maybe you won't, but uh, David Frum wrote a speech for George W. Bush, and it referred to, I think, when David Frum supposedly wrote it, it was only two in the axis of evil, but uh, or some uh, there was some slight change to his wording, which is part of uh, David Frum's own uh, reformation project. But the bottom line is uh, what he was taking credit for at the time was an axis of evil that included Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. So... Uh, by mid-2002, after it was clear not only that the U.S. was not living up to its end of the bargain, but that Bush had come in with a significant amount of hostility, enough to say, like, I'm not going to agree that we don't have hostile intent. I can I just add one thing? Also directly undermining the South Korean government's policy at the time, which was sunshine. So they not only torpedoed our own relatively successful bilateral one, they screwed their ally, which they was pursuing yes. its own parallel track. Exactly. We're going to do everything we can, not only to not support the agreement we've made in the past, but to isolate you. John Bolton, who was force-fed into this, rammed down our throats in a, um, in a uh, appointment, a recess appointment to the United Nations, warned Kim to, quote, draw the appropriate lesson from Iraq. Right? Okay, I'll restart my nuke program. And that's exactly what they did. They restarted the Yang Byung reactor. They made more weapons-grade plutonium. Then China, which was concerned, got the U.S. and North Korea to participate in a six-party talks along with South Korea, Japan, and Russia. This is from a piece uh, by a guy named Mike Chinoy, who wrote uh, Meltdown, the inside story of the North Korean crisis. In September of 2005, the parties reached an accord on principles for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, in which Washington and Pyongyang agreed to respect each other's sovereignty, exist peacefully together, and take steps to normalize their relations. However, on that same week... The Treasury Department designated Macau's Banco Delta Asia, where North Korea maintained dozens of accounts, as a suspected money laundering concern. Because you know how, how on top of money laundering the Bush administration was. And so it was basically a financial sanction on North Korea right after they had agreed to let's you know, ease it up. And then the six-party talks fell apart. Uh, you had the first nuclear test in October of 2006, which followed that. Even after North Korea asked for a, another round of multi-party talks, the Bush administration said, no way. In 2007, 
Chinese again set up six-party talks. Washington basically said uh, we're not coming unless Pyongyang uh, accepts inspections that were so instruct- uh, intrusive. One American official, according to uh, Mike Chinoy, described them as a, quote, national proctologic exam. Um, at that point, you had conservative governments in Seoul and Tokyo, and they moved to halt energy and promised in the 2007 deal, unless North Korea uh, agreed to the new verification members, um, they would uh, cut off any aid they were giving them at that time. Pyongyang said, fine, goodbye, we're all done. Everything, we get it. We get it. You guys are dicks. And and now, that's exactly what happened. And then, but even in that, really twisted dynamic there was like this certain both sides would push it to the brink and then step back a little bit and now it's like you know with trump does he even have the ability to do something like right and what this shows that i mean this shows like how what george bush did in 2002 ripples out and it's like one of those death kidney punches right you get it you walk around for three weeks you think you're fine and all of a sudden you drop dead because your kidneys collapse or something i'm i don't know maybe those are made up punches but my point being is the theoretical death kidney punch i wish i could do bush as good as you because it's a line like right. see another jackie what, and who, also who's another bruce lee fan here i would add every time you retweet david from know that more than your average Joe that you're retweeting, he owns a bit, a little, a little bit. You know, in the event that we end up seeing an intercontinental ballistic missile land somewhere, or if we end up seeing hundreds of thousands of South Koreans and hundreds of thousands of North Koreans die, you got to give a little bit of that credit. You know, maybe in the tens or fifty thousands to David Frum. Yes. The whole the whole Republican ally thing is delusional in general and just actually like offensive specifically with him. Look, use him for what he's worth um, is one thing, but understand who you're dealing with. And I don't know how much he's worth, frankly. I don't know I mean, either. what currency so does far, he really have in the Republican Party? So far, none. He, I think some, all it does is, he, you know, they can go on... Uh, uh, on uh, CNN or MSNBC exactly. and make everybody feel like, oh, there are reasonable that, people in that part. Exactly. He's actually just carrying water for a toxic brand. Still. Exactly. It's damaging. And his greatest legacy is making war with North Korea more likely. And also, not to mention the invasion we did do. But I they mean, were the axis of evil. Right. Two they, countries that were enemies. Understand. Two enemies and one country that had nothing to do with either of them well, makes total sense. That is modern axis of evil. That is the thing you don't understand, David Michael, Frum is... about evil. <laughs> evil can Tell bring me. people together, even if they are enemies. We can be evil together. You can come into evil, stop by evil. From everybody, the fucking halal of Iraq you... to the fucking halal of Iran to the evil little chopstick eaters of North Korea. It is evil. It's big league. We don't care who you are. Just come in. If you're evil, you're evil. That's all we see. All we see is evil. We don't see any other difference. And David Frum was like, white man's burden, invade the world, destroy international law, but maybe in the future Iraq will have some type of like pro-Israel, petro-state, clash of civilizations guy. And now we have, why don't we just nuke them? Except for the Saudis. They're great. Hey, can't we just... Uh... Saudis are great. How about it? I'll tell you what. I'll write to China on Twitter. Tell them to just do this. <laughs> Try a bit harder, guys. Did you see that? Fo- I did see some footage of Ch- of uh, Jerry Brown got an official state. Like he actually got to meet with the Chinese premier, like which is pretty rare for like a governor. And they were just talking about climate change. And you know, it's ridiculous to read too much of the body language. But there was this element of like you could just see him sitting there and projecting onto him, like. Jesus Christ. We got Why a, are uh, you not? We got a Buzz Aldrin um, uh, body language video. We'll, we'll run that later. In the <laughs> I don't think there's, there's any no projection sound. in that one. There's no sound. <laughs> that one's very clear. <clears throat> I just uh, briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's just sort of stunning to me. Um, apparently, Mark Pincus, the guy who found the company that made Farmville. Oh, this ass. Yes. 
This Farmville is, is a is ever. an app. It's like it's like Candy Crush, but just not quite as big. And so he's got a ton of money. And then this guy Reed Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, has got a ton of money. And they are they have plans to rejuvenate the Democratic Party. Oh, I bet what they're going to do is they're going to say that they should have a higher tax rate and we could use their money that they made from creating fake farms and a useless resume factory online to invest in infrastructure and national health insurance, right? Do you remember we had those guys on from Kick the Can? <laughs> I envision a new program of Kick the Can down, down the road. I do remember that. This is, they're, they're, <clears throat> they've created a... Uh, an organization called Win the Future, which, if you didn't know, is WTF, because because of the kids, and uh, it's a platform for crowdsourcing ideas that can sway the party in a new direction. And one of the amazing things is they their whole premise is Democratic politicians haven't been responsive enough to ordinary Americans, and what they're looking for is also simultaneously a policy agenda uh, rooted in fears that the party is already moving too far to the left. And he'd like it to make it more pro-business, like ordinary Americans must really want. Because businesses don't get enough. We need the ability to crowdsource everything. And Alex Lawson who we've had on this program from uh, Social Security Works, <laughs> had a great quote. The weakness of the Democratic Party is not due to an underrepresentation of venture capitalists and tech company board members. Um, apparently, Pincus pitched Hoffman in 2015 to raise a billion dollars on Kickstarter to get Michael Bloomberg elected. All these people need to be locked in pyramids. They need to be. They need to just go. Here's away. how I would raise a billion dollars to get Michael Bloomberg elected. I would set up a Kickstarter, and then I would call Michael Bloomberg, <laughs> oh, and I'd say, a, "Hey, what a, what a <laughs> plucky effort! I've got one, pri- I've got one prize to unlock." You know, as I grow across the country from Aruba Vacation Resorts, which I guess technically isn't in the country, but whatever. I'm talking about humans, after all. <laughs> To the Upper East Side, to at times the Upper West Side, but not so much. To, to Westchester, Aspen. to Aspen, to Jackson Hole, with the occasional touchdown in Silicon Valley. I hear a cry for lower corporate ex- expat taxes <laughs> and to ban fat, disgusting slobs from Slurpees and guns. And it's that message that will take me to the White House. Why are we wasting all of this time on self driving cars? All of my cars are self-driving. I've never touched a steering wheel in months. Years. <laughs> Years. Sometimes traditional solutions can work. <laughs> um, so uh, the guy made- they have sent, sunk. This is what really annoys me. They have put 500 grand into Win the Future, which um, it provides uh, internet browsers the opportunity to support various policy proposals, including a demand that the government, quote, offer every American, you ready for this, a free engineering degree. So selfless. It's not like Silicon Valley would have any self-interest <laughs> in publicly subsidized <laughs> degrees that specifically benefit their field. That's the type well, of selfless <laughs> corporate citizenship <laughs> that I'm talking about. Also, free G- app game development courses for everyone <laughs> as yeah. long as you then work on behalf of Farmville. Do you have a hack to make virtual potato farms, son? Well, you too can get a free degree if you sign a lifelong contract to work for us for under market value. There you go. <laughs> That's the other thing. It's also, it promises to put the ideas that get the most backing. You ready for this? On billboards in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's so brilliant because that's what people will see. Do yes, you see? But what we're going to do, those billboards will be digital. 
They'll be so <laughs> when you go to work in the when you go to work in the morning, it'll say cut corporate taxes. But when you go home oh. at night, it'll say cut social security. <laughs> now that's the carrot. The stick is something I call genocide for the 21st century, where we just slowly and gradually right. kill out a good chunk of the population that makes under three million dollars a year. They are also. We're contemplating campaigning against Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein. Uh, Dianne Feinstein can't do enough for these people. They don't even know people out of touch. supporting their own platforms. We'd like to see uh, uh, either political outsiders or politicians who are ready to put the people ahead of their career. One of the political outsiders that Pincus is trying to recruit is Stefan Jenkins, frontman for the 1990s rock band Third Eye Blind. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if this is a real story. <laughs> this, I, 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 <laughs> don't get to look this up because I'm starting to think I might have just been That's duped. That's amazing. No, I saw it. I saw it all over no, Twitter. It's a Daniel uh, Mann. All right, so let me just say face. there's a chance that this could be totally fake. And... Like maybe it was on a Huffington Post. No, maybe. it was Daniel Marins, who uh, is a, a fan of the show. Actually, wrote it. It's well, the biggest maybe, maybe troll magnet, or maybe he's just doing idea it. I've Did this just show of. up on my browser? Is this maybe he's just? <laughs> <laughs> Check out our billboards, everybody! Uh, hey, this is why we're going to need to phase out Medicare a little bit. <laughs> if this launches, it, it should not be hard for the online left community to take over this platform immediately and have all the memes that are generated oh, I think on the it other be like, th- let's seize the like foss- all fossil fuels for the state. Yeah, and stuff. yeah exactly. well, I think that they, they also, there were two other things in the article. One was that I think that I think it was this article. They haven't bought similar domain names, so they're yes. right for the type of thing Matt's talking yes. about. Yes. And then the other thing, I forget what, what is said it about it, the tech only, people? So the other tech people don't realize like you've got to to buy the similar names for. There's a everybody great, knows that. There's a well, apparently not the guy who made. We tried to get WTF pod. I the, I think I probably own like multiple WTF ones just to try and get Marin's traffic. The other, the I other think th- I bought those. The other thing though, when is, John Benjamin's television show came out, I bought H V. Of course you did. Wait, it's, uh, it's whatever J B eight uh, H V, <laughs> and I was like, dude. If this thing goes well, it looks like you're going to have to buy it from me. I forget who said it. One of the people in the article, though, made a really, they were, it was, they were like, look, if you're, if you're so, like, go, fun, go uh, not that it will work, but, like, go waste your money inside the Republican Party. You know, like, the very least. Right. If you're, like, why don't you go try to address the party and say, like, look, you need to stop being embarrassing on social issues and acknowledge the science of global you'd, warming. You'd have and to get a different that, front man. You what would. Band, what, what band leader would you have to get? I don't know. <laughs> Garth Brooks. Oh, wait, isn't he a Democrat? I don't know. I don't know. So, real blue state bias in that comment I All just right. made. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. We've Fair got... We're going to talk about Chris Christie. What? Uh, How high did his approval ratings get? At he's peak? at 15%. No, no, no. But in his peak, when he was 60, in the 70s, right? Oh, I don't know if 70s, right. but 60s. Um, we've got a clip of uh, Bernie Sanders talking about uh, Medicare for All. Tom Price pretending that there's a secret plan to mitigate the impact of the known health care plan. And it has heart, right, Tom? Um, a wonderful clip of Donald Trump getting completely lost after he was deplaning. Confusing. Uh, we got pictures of Governor Christie, and we will... Um, oh, uh, the... What happens... We will answer the question. What happens when NPR actually tweets out the Declaration of Independence... On the day in which we commemorate its adoption, you're never going to believe what happened next. <laughs> All right, uh, 646-257-3920. Folks, it is your support that makes this show possible. If you have the financial means to support this show, uh, we really need you to. 
It is how we operate this program. You can go to jointhemajorityreport.com. A lot of you listen to the show for free. You've been listening for three months. Maybe you've been listening for six months, nine months. Support the program. And as a way of saying thank you, we give you an option. You can listen to two, two and a half hours a day of stuff. You can listen to only the fun half stuff, which is funnier and funner. So, you know, maybe one day it's like, hmm, I don't know if I can hear handle listening to the 14th uh, interview of the month about the intricacies of how um, we decided to formulate medical health care policy back in the 1930s. I think I'm just going to listen to the fun half today. People do that all the time. So uh, if you have the financial means, please join the majority report dot com, join the majority report dot com, wherein you can join the majority report dot com. Also, just coffee dot co-op, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10 percent off. And if you buy your crap from jet dot com, if you buy your crap from Amazon dot com, do so through our links at majority report kickback dot com. Every time you buy through there, you will notice no difference. But we get a kickback. See you in the fun half. Sad. She said no, no.